I went to bed at 2.30. So I got an idea, and so I got up in the middle. I'm one of those, when I get an idea, I kind of go with it. So I was reading a book, and uh, so um, I'm extending the metaphor, Dr. Dr. Hill Coleman, okay? Let's go back to our original icebreaker. We had what? Farmer. We had farmer. Dog. We had the dog. We had the chicken and the rice, right? They had to get across the way, across the river. So I mean, this is just. I'm just going to try, the way my mind works, you know, um, I'm not the smartest guy in the room, but I, I connect everything to everything. So I'm going to go back to the training and then go back to what you did on Monday. Here's my answer. I'm going to give you my answer. I'm taking the chicken. Right? So chicken is over here. And I'm going to go back and get the dog mm -hmm. and take the dog and I'm going to take the chicken back. Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to take the rice mm -hmm. and I'm going to take the chicken. And why is that important? Because sometimes in the field that we're in, you got to go the long way for a child, right? Just to keep somebody safe, you might have to do a whole bunch of extra stuff just to keep somebody safe. Anybody ever here work a 10 hour day before? Anybody here ever work a 12 hour day before? I had to have, I'm about to have my come to God moment with my wife in about two weeks <laughs> when she's like, okay, you've been getting in here at nine o'clock or you know, and, and so I got to, I have to be very aggressive about how I spend time with her and my children. Like, whenever there's time, I can't schedule nothing else with anybody, you know? But sometimes we have to go this route because it really takes that level of effort for a particular child, and that makes all the difference. Um, I was going to do another icebreaker, but I decided to do that one because I'm, I'm an icebreaker guy. I like icebreakers, right? But, um, so that's our good morning slide. I'm a coffee guy. I didn't have my coffee. My wife thinks I have too much coffee, so I didn't drink any coffee today. She's going to ask me, did you drink some coffee? I'm like, nope. I'm going to go to the next slide. <laughs> what happens with me is I have a trouble sleeping at night, especially when I'm doing something like this, because I think about things all the time. I'm one of those kind of people that comes up with ideas, and I have to go with it, so I write things down all the time. Like, even as you all are talking, I'm writing stuff down because there's so many ideas and I try to capture them because it won't come to you the same way, you know? So one of the things I want to do as, a, as a, another icebreaker, which sets up the training for today and sets up the work for culture. This is the Ebbinghaus curve of forgetting. Has anybody ever heard of this? On this side is retention. So we're talking about culture, right, and climate. On this side is elapsed time since learning. I want somebody to explain this graph to us. Um, the more time that goes by, the less they retain Let me do that one more time. The more time Mrs. Presbury. Because <laughs> I, I want to get into the habit of saying your names because, you know, yes, Mrs. Presbury. Yeah. Okay. So the more time that goes on, the less information or whatever it is. Very good scientific answer. I'm going to give you a B on that one. You're drawing a cultural Maybe correlation. Other factors, okay. Other distractors. Okay. All right. So, and I left it before the gift card. I have a Panera gift card. And I will have it here tomorrow, I promise. I left it on my desk. What is the golden nugget of this slide? 
What is the A plus answer? So yes. So I'm gonna say your answer was right. Your answer was correct. And it was, you deepened it, right? Mr. Skinner, you took it a little deeper. That was right on it, but what's the, what's the gold nugget of this slide? That's not wrong. Can I give it to you, or y'all want to try to get this Panera card? What's the, but what's, what's, what's the million dollar piece of information? None of those answers are wrong. Can I give it to you? Mm -hmm. Right. So the elapsed time is the time between that, that happens between from the time you learn something. I want, you know, I'm going go to go A, 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 A. You have to repeat things. Right. That's repetition. Repetition. Yes. Repetition. Because what? The gold nugget is the biggest drop occurs in the first 20 minutes. Right. I want you to really think about the fact that a bigger drop occurs in 20 minutes than occurs after 31 days. That's the goal of the slide. Meaning, so you said that? Did you say 21 minutes? I didn't hear that. Well, they said that too, but I'm trying to, I was trying to get you to say it a different way because they said that as well. I couldn't, I really couldn't hear you. Did you say it? Then I'm a, I got your card for you tomorrow then. Yeah. Give her a round of applause. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 I'm a, yes, sir. When you think about that, though, in school, what's so scary about that is that if they, if you already forgetting about it within 20 minutes, like the goal sometimes is to have reiterated what's going on in school with younger kids at home, mm -hmm. reinforcement. Mm -hmm. So if they're already forgetting, because I ask my grandson all the time, what you do in school today? They don't send me like, I'm six years old. I don't remember what happened mm -hmm. six or seven hours ago. Right. Because a lot of things happen. Right. So that part is scary. It's right. 58% after 20 minutes. Right. And that's of what you were paying attention to. Right. If I'm daydreaming, I don't even have that 100% for me is different than you. See, this is why people do the same things at age 50 that they did at age 15. Because people are, we, we, what you do most is what you do best. Next slide, sir, please. One more. One more. Boom. So we want to review. What were some of the gold bricks from Monday. Stuff that you jumped out about, it's specifically from the training we did on climate and culture. Things that people even in the room said. Because I'm not just the teacher, I'm the facilitator. Right? So I'm facilitating a conversation because there were things, the things I remember most are some of the things that you all said. We talked about your experiences, right? Mr. Bosley? Like the relationships as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, it's just like you won't remember certain information, like it might click to you if you see something of that nature, but you won't remember it if you're not practicing. Like That's right. That's right. I always, you know, I always do a chart, and it's in my room. It'll be in my office. You know, I'm a big, um, my kids probably think I'm corny, you know, because I use quotes all the time. I think in terms of quotes. I read quotes because it helps me to think about complex things in a very few words. So I always am, on my wall is always thought, action, habit, character, destiny. I have that on my wall all the time and I read it every day. So you have thought, habit, action, or ha thought, action, habit, character, destiny. What does that mean? I feel like that's the order. That's the order, right? One leads to the other, mm -hmm. but I can determine where I'll end up by what I think about. Right? It's how you right? reach your goal. It's right. Exactly. But the key is, the key juncture in the whole sequence is habit. Because now I've taken a thought 
and I'm able to do something over and over and over without what? Without thinking about it. This is what gets us into. So we're not just talking about learning in the classroom here. We're talking about behavior. When people begin to do things enough, before they know it, even against their will, they'll start to do things to help themselves. Remember, I went to basketball camp. I thought it was impossible for me to fall asleep at 930. I was at that age when I'm just like, I'm up. After one week of them getting us up at 7, and we have to go play ball all day, and I'm out there getting worn out by those guys, every day I was in bed at 9, I was waking up at 7, and it continued, right? So anything else from Monday, just reviewing? What else did we talk about? Did you remember anything? Doesn't have to be from me, anything. Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Right. And then he to us. Okay. So we caught that vision. Yeah. One other thing, uh, when you were talking about the seven wells, it's actually not something I want to do with it too because how you were just saying once they get into the habit of something, mm-hmm. then they'll just get used to it. We want to start talking about that on Friday and next week, the whole session, those wells. Mr. Mosley. Yes and then yes. Or your lecture when you share about the our experiences. Mm-hmm. 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 That really stayed with me. The things you all were saying, because we want to, it gives you a sense of, you, you know, people remember how you felt in certain spaces, right? I remember Mr. Wilson said, my teacher made me feel like I was a genius, and so I didn't want to prove them wrong. Right? You remember that? Think about that. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Um, for me, um, Mr. Ferguson and I were talking, and um, I like when Dr. Kennedy talked about the campus and the mindset of what the kids would see. Like, if you grow up in poverty, or if you grow up in an urban area that you know could have certain things. The thing that resonated with me is when I grew up in the Hill District, you had to cross Center Avenue. Mm-hmm. So if you grew up in Homewood, you had to cross Frankstown Avenue and see mm-hmm. the wino or the junkie or whatever, mm-hmm. unsafe conditions. Mm-hmm. This is what you're seeing on the way to school. Mm-hmm. But when you come here, you're going to see architects, engineers, businessmen, businesswomen. Mm-hmm. It's the whole mindset mm-hmm. of something positive around you. That's right. As opposed trying to get through the worst part of the neighborhood to school. Mm-hmm. And I think that for me is just huge because that's what I felt growing up. Mm-hmm. Just got to get to school. I got to get there safe. Mm-hmm. And give them an environment where they can see because it was the first and I were talking. And um, um, Mr. Wilson as well. For me, that was the motivation. I could look downtown mm-hmm. from Webster Avenue from Bedford Avenue, and I could see all the scouts. That's where you want to be. That's mm-hmm. where you want to be. I would see the businessmen on the 81B or the 82 Lincoln, whatever they called it back then, with their briefcase and their Wall Street Journal. I said, that's what I want to emulate, mm-hmm. not mm-hmm. that over there. Mm-hmm. So I think that whole mindset of being in a positive environment is going to be hard. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So just to show them what they can become. It's a mentality, isn't it? And Mr. C said on Monday, as I recollect, School for many children is a what? Is a safe space, right? It's a safe haven. I would tell the teachers that one time a big fight broke out in Perry. I'm like, these boys are fighting because they know that we can solve this problem. If it gets out into Manchester, somebody's going to get killed. The biggest gang leader, he's dead now. He got killed as a grown man. But he came to me when I was doing my groups in Perry. And he said, Mr. Malk, he said, it's about to go down this weekend. And he's like, but I'm trying to do what you're teaching us. He said, but I can't stop it. He said, but if you get us together, everybody will listen to you. Because I really don't want to kill nobody and I don't want to die. They had shot one of his boys 
And they, he knew that they, you can't not respond because it looks like you, you know. So, but if I get involved, he said, we'll listen, everybody will listen to you, right? So that's what we're dealing with sometimes. So we have to repeat things over and over and over, not just academically or intellectually, but behaviorally, right? We want to talk today about vital behaviors. What are the most important things you need to be able to do? Like, for instance, what is a vital behavior that we all have been doing for the past 16 months? Or they've, they've prescribed for people throughout the country? Masks. That one behavior, which is very controversial for some people, right? One of my friends called me from Vegas. She's like, don't you feel like our rights are being violated? And I said, well, that's an interesting perspective. She said, yeah, I, I'm just, I, I don't like my right. And she had COVID the very next week. She called me crying. Her boyfriend looked like he was about to die. Now, I'm not making a statement about masks, but I'm saying it has been proven in hospitals. My physician has watched over 20 people in his facility die who work there. Janitorial staff, nurses, carried out on stretchers, right? Just that one measure alone, somebody determined could stop hundreds of thousands of people from potentially contracting COVID or dying because, you know, people are dying from this. I know, how many people know someone who has passed away from COVID? I know many people who have died personally. I know people that I know personally who were not, I didn't think I could catch it. I was just that type, of, I'm just healthy, and, but I, I, I was hurt and my back was so herniated I couldn't breathe well. And when I got into the hospital, I got pneumonia. And that was it. I got it in the hospital. So that was determined to be a vital behavior. And when we ritualize, meaning we have certain things that we do over and over and over that we give meaning to. Like, this means something to me. How many of you all in education, I would suspect this is you, sir, you, ma'am. There's certain stuff you have to do just to get ready for work every day. Anybody have those kind of little rituals you do? There's certain things I have to do. I call it the hour of power for me. My hour of power is at night. I don't take phone calls. I'm not responding to texts. I'm not even interacting with my wife and my kids. I go into a room by myself and I have to get my mind ready and I rehearse everything I want to do. I do. You know, and I, I, I do certain exercises. You know, I'm a, like a meditation guy. I sit and I visualize what I want to do. And I give myself a report card, like, what did, where did you go wrong today? And how do you need to be better? And I make, a, I make a, a pledge to be better. And I go through all the different virtues for myself and look at those. And then I look at my five, I'll talk about this on Friday, but my five roles. How was I with the people above me? How was I with the people beside me? How was I with my wife? How was I with my children and the people over whom I have leadership? And how was I when nobody else was around? Those are the five roles that I'll talk about. Son, brother, mate, father, self. And I look at each one and then I go to bed and I take into my mind what I need to do for the next day. That's just me. I'm nobody special, but I have to have imperfections. And I feel like the substance of my love for you is my commitment to be better. Just to be better. So we want to create that culture where we have certain things that we do that make the boys get into an energy state to do what they have to do because a lot of us aren't feeling it every moment right you talked about that some days you come in you might not be ready that day remember but what do you have to do to get yourself there I had to learn how to do that you know I had to learn how to, even before I spoke I, with people I didn't know how to speak in front of anybody and so I just how I was do something to connect with people and then when I fell in love with people that I was talking to the words just came into my mind, you know? So what kind of things do we do to change the state? Because everybody wants to feel a certain way, right? They want to be in a certain state. They want to be able to feel like I can do this. This has meaning to me. We talked about relevance, right? So what kind of things, so we're going to do a little exercise here today on this, okay? What are, what the things, when you walk into life, isn't that a powerful acronym? How do we give life to people? 
Next. So I'm going to talk about these a little bit more, but I'm just giving you like previews. I like to seed your mind. So I plant a seed and I'll throw some water on it. So I'm going to talk about oak school and self-image, but mainly these are about the self-fulfilling prophecy that many of our boys are living and people in general. Oak school, very briefly, was an experiment where they gave the kids IQ tests and they randomly selected children and said they are due for a performance jump. You've heard of it. Dr. Rosenthal and Dr. Jacobson. And what ended up happening, particularly for the younger children, is there was a statistically significant increase in these students' performance. Now, they were chosen all randomly. And the rationale, scientifically, was that this increase occurred, why? Because of teacher expectations. Self-image uh, psychology came from a guy named Prescott Lakey, who was actually the counselor of John F. Kennedy who became president, obviously, and was tragically assassinated. But he developed the whole idea of self-image. He would give all his students for several semesters a certain grade. And what ended up happening is their academic performance increased and improved without any study coaching on his part. Much like Mr. Wilson's situation, right? Some of our children have been made to think that they're not bright. This is not their spot, school, right? It might be the basketball court, any, but this is not, I'm not in my element here. A lot of our kids feel that way, right? But when you give them a sense of that, it's amazing how your subconscious will begin to work to confirm a positive thing. We're gonna talk about stereotype threat on Friday, just a bit, but who knows where the most significant practice of expectations is carried out? It's in science. The experiment is called the double blind. That's how drugs are tested and proven. What is the double blind? It's where the person administering the placebo and the person administering the actual drug substance they don't even know which one it is. It's a double blind, right? They don't know and you don't know. Now somebody back here knows, but they don't know who's getting it. I don't know and you don't know. Why don't I know, Mr. Ferguson? Because if I know my expectation, they have proven scientifically can influence the activity of that substance in your, in your body and spirit. Just by me knowing that, just think about that. I don't think people understand how powerful and significant that really is. In science, you cannot have a drug proven if the people administering it know which one it is. Because something in the nuance of how they communicate in, in their psyche will touch your psyche. That's what happens when you're around people who believe in you. There's something about them that makes you feel like you can do it. Right? Without them saying a word. Just body language. Just, just there's a certain energy when people believe in you. I was running with my daughter one time. We used to run track. She didn't even like it. We were running track. And she used to run like a deer next to me. You know, I'd have to really run. She was really, really fast. And she'd get with the kids and she would freeze up. And one day, you know, I'm like, honey, come on, let's. Let's run. And she's running. I said, yeah, just run like that. Look at your striding next to me. I said, now, when you get with the kids, why, you know, why don't you run like that? She said, because when I'm around you, Daddy, I feel like I, I have powers that I don't have when I'm by myself, right? And so I started really thinking about how can I do that with her to make her feel, because I thought she was, the, you know, like a, like a gazelle, and she's picking up on that, right? So. One of the things that you'll realize about kids and about culture is you cannot hide your perception of people from them. Not really. What you really think of someone is having an effect on them even if you don't want it to. It's very, very important. Like I said on Monday, 
I've never had a great relationship with anybody for whom I had a negative regard. Matter of fact, me and my father hadn't spoken in a while at one point. And right before I went into the hospital, I used to, every night when I did my hour of power, I would just imagine me and him just laughing next to each other. And I woke up in the hospital and he was sitting next to me. And he said something, and I was like, Dad. And I realized that was the, the, the vision I had. And he started laughing and I started laughing like nothing had ever happened. I was like, man, I just thank you for being here with me. And I went, I, mean, I hit his chest, I went like that. I said, thank you. And he was like, oh man, you know. And it was, it was the image I had in a dream, right? Because I, I decided I'm gonna just think positively about him no matter what happens, don't matter. You know what I mean? And so part of what we're gonna do is get into how do we do that when someone else's Im image of themselves may be so negative that you have to overcome that. See, some teachers say, you know, I don't care unless you care. My thing is, if you stop, if you don't care, I'm never going to stop caring, Mr. C. You know, I'm here to transfer my care to you. Not to contingent on whether you care about yourself or not. People say that, that you know, the only person who can, nobody can love you like you love yourself. I believe that's not true. I believe there's people who love me more than I love me at different times in my life. And I learned to love myself because of those people. I learned to love myself because of, they, they transferred that to me. You see that? So everybody look at expectations a little bit. And I'll give you some more literature on that. But I'm just seeking your mind because this is stuff I really believe in. These are my secrets. I'm not, I'm no skilled, but I use this throughout my career. And they'll be like, how'd you get that kid to do that? It's like, cause I, I'm looking at him in a certain way in my mind all through the day. I used to have index cards. I got this from John Wooden. I would write down positive things about kids I had problematic relationships with and I would read those before I interacted with them. I'll see how many good things I could list about that child and keep an index card. And I would read it before I knew I had to see them every day. Next slide. So we looked at these four, right? We didn't really look at them. We just kind of alluded to them. So let's dive into them just a little bit. Yes, sir. Next slide. Sorry about that. West Side. In 1975, established by Marva Collins, she was a 14-year permanent substitute. And she became disillusioned with her children's education and the students she was teaching. So she pulled her children out of private schools and started her own school on the second floor of the house or the apartment building where she lived with her $5,000 pension. Left her job, right? So I just want to show a quick clip about Ms. Collins. Oh, I think I turned it down. One minute. started her own elementary school on the city's west side, West Side Prep. Marva claimed that with love, hard work, and no-nonsense teaching, inner city children could compete with anyone academically. It was, to many people, quite an inspiring story. But not to Charles Murray, author of the controversial book about race and intelligence called The Bell Curve. On page 399, Murray writes that Marva's celebrated anecdotes about her students are too good to be true, that there is no hard evidence of her success. We decided to check it out. Before we begin, let's go back to where we began 16 years ago. You have it all here on West Adams Street, all the familiar big city blight. The forever broken windows, the burned out flats, the disemboweled abandoned cars. And then you have 3819 West Adams, Canterbury Tales know about whom? Jeff and Charles, they're about whom? How many Canterbury Tales know about how many were there? There are no frills at West Side. The emphasis is on basic education, with an even stronger emphasis on literature and composition. There are no teacher breaks, no teacher desks. She is on her feet and over their shoulders all day, pushing them, cajoling them, and praising them. Very, very good, Lisa. 
And the results are apparent even to a casual bystander. Alert and challenge children being pushed way beyond the boundaries most school systems set. And who's your favorite author? Jeffrey Chaucer Jeffrey and Shakespeare. Booker T. Washington and Hans Christian Andersen. My favorite book is The Great Myth. Great Myth. I like George Wodowski and uh, Dante Alighieri and Shakespeare. And your favorite book? Divine Comedy. <laughs> I like Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau, and I like Charlotte Bronze, Jane Eyre. So what happened to those 34 students we met at West Side Prep? Charles Murray says by implication that their apparent intelligence and promise was a fraud, that what we saw was just too good to be true. Or was it? We traced 33 of the 34 and flew a group of them back to Chicago, back to West Side Prep's new location for a reunion of sorts. To see if Charles Murray's allegations in the bell curve are true, to see whether or not the young men and women lived up to Marvis claim. Christopher Stubblefield. We are to read our eight-year-old with a big voice is now at university in Texas. And Erica McCoy Pace graduated last spring from Norfolk State University. <laughs> when you saw her last, she was listing her favorite authors. Emerson, Henry David Thoreau. And what about the rest of our class of 79? Michael Anderson, Taylor, Terry Holmes, I want to operate a transportation company. Latina Singleton, preschool teacher. James Lowe, Staff Sergeant, United States Air Force. Sabrina Yates, sixth grade teacher. Russell Winters, law student. Lewis Johnson, operations manager. Xavier Jones, teacher, criminalist. Craig Brunner, clerk for the state's attorney's office. I remember I had said in front of all my classmates here that I want to become an attorney. And it's funny, I, 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 I'm naturally who I'm doing that graduating next year. And the college told me, oh yes, you can do it. You can do whatever you want to do. It's possible. And I'm living proof it is possible. A number of you are teachers. Were you inspired by her to become teachers? Definitely. She just gave so much to me personally in terms of um, always being reassuring. I mean, just the small thing when she would it, grab my face and say, pretty girl. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You're brilliant. You're brilliant. You're brilliant. Especially Craig. She would take his head and raise it up. He go, honey, you're brilliant. Mm -hmm. And, you know, after someone telling you that, Every day, five days a week, for three or four years, you know, that's in you. That becomes a part of you. You were brilliant, honey. And then we were like playing Shakespeare. We put on the play. We're going to pause it right there and go to the next one. So she said excellence is a habit, right? What you do most is what you do best. So that was why we're looking at Marva Collins in terms of establishing the proper self-identity and the excellence that happens when you have someone who's willing to invest that in children. I put that example for that reason. That's what made me want to go into teaching when I saw that. I saw there was two things. One is the movie Lean On Me, even though I know I was, that wasn't my style, and also the Marva Carlin story. I saw those and I remember thinking, man, maybe I can, I think I want to be a teacher. Schilling Experiment, 1990, so we're, we're going up you know, to the next phase, okay? Although busing brought balance to many schools, Shinley was not one of them. In 1981, the State Human Relations Commission moved to disband the nearly all black school, then the city's lowest achieving. Instead, Shinley rose to become a national model of voluntary integration, the school's inventive reforms, a state-of-the-art teacher's training center, a blue chip faculty and attractive magnet programs drew students of all races, some of whom left private schools. Shelley became the school of choice. Some of you, I showed this before we walked in this morning, and it culminated in 1994, made national news, Newsweek, and all the different publications where people stood out for one week in the winter, in the cold, to get their students into Shenley. I mean, they were in a line where they slept on the ground in sleeping bags to get their students into Shinley High School. They had a state-of-the-art drama program that rivaled Kappa's 
Anything Cap was doing today, Shinley was doing that stuff first. Right? I mean, put on productions that'll blow your mind. Their sports programs, their academic programs, their international baccalaureate program, their teacher training programs. And it drew the very best teachers. They say in the book, Shinley succeeded because everybody, staff and students, wanted to be there. So you had people from all over the city trying to get into this one school, which was Shinley, which, which was what? The lowest performing school in the district previously, in some people's estimation. Shinley, incidentally, was also the first public school in Pittsburgh. It was called um, Central. Central in 50, I think it was 1855. Right? 1855. right? And it was rebranded as Shinley, and they put the building together. Shinley is, this is a book I really recommend you reading because it was a transformation of the culture. And it was where you get people who want to be somewhere and what happens, right? Next slide, Mr. C, please. Thank you, sir. Oh, next slide. I was going to do an exercise. I'm going to skip that for the sake of time. The Harlem Children's Zone, which was actually formed in 1970, the concept, but rose to prominence in the late 90s and really became prominent in the early 2000s. That which we know of is this. So this is Jeffrey Canada. He was the founder. He's the president and CEO. These are some of the youth here. I'm just, we're taking notes of these case studies. We're gonna do a little exercise in a second. What are we seeing? This is the campus. This is the scope of the Harlem Children's Zone. It's over 10 square blocks. They, that all this is a campus, right? They have early childhood, elementary, middle school, high school, college, and family and community programs. Components of the zone are a baby college, a series of workshops for parents of children ages zero through three. Anybody else want to read? Okay, okay. So these are the, this is their model. The pipeline to combat the prison to pipeline is from cradle to career. And to have supportive programs around health and wellness, which is a huge thing, right? Trauma, just overall physiological health. I'll talk about the brain on Friday and how we're dealing with the, the adolescent male brain and body and just what that looks like a little bit, and in family and community engagement. Harlem Children's Zone believed they needed to affect the whole family. Urban Prep Academy, the forerunner. So I, I showed you HCZ uh, because of scope, to give you a sense of somebody else who's doing something that's similar to the scope of what we're trying to do. Because a lot of people who've never seen that before might think that's not even possible. Right? But it is. We opened up repress because, frankly, in the state of Chicago, young African American males are in crisis. We've got a 60% high school dropout rate, a 2.5% college completion rate. Many of us, we didn't have much hope for ourselves as far as our future was concerned. I really didn't have any thoughts about college. I was just trying to graduate in grade. And part of what we have to do here at Urban Prep is change those statistics. We want to increase the number of African American young men who are earning college degrees in this city and in this country. It means a lot to be here, to be at a school where people care about me, to be somewhere that 
I know that people want me to succeed. It motivates you to do the things that you think you cannot do, like applying to college. It made me think about college now. I'm very excited to go to college. They are supportive, and I think that's the biggest key in this whole school is just the support that they have for us to become the world around the person that wants me to become. So I have the tools that I need to succeed in college. We want them to grow up to be exceptional and be real positive contributors to their society. They just offer a vast amount of opportunities for our brothers to best excel. Like going to colleges and universities, like uh, University of Michigan and Stanford. And this summer I'm going to a junior law program at DePaul University. I study a broad program that takes me to South Africa to study engineering, which is one of the most mind-blowing opportunities I've ever had in my entire life. It's tough to be what you don't see. And so we take our jobs as role models to these young men very, very seriously. We want to make sure that our students see examples in men and women who work at Urban Prep of excellence, of exceptionality, the positive role models, the positive people that are around you every day. It puts us in a position to pursue success. They're always complimenting us and they're always giving us advice. Like they're our own parents pushing me to accomplish greater things that I never thought I could ever do. I'm able to like climb mountains. These teachers really care about my future. Everyone's here to help you in the college counseling area, teachers, staff, and your peers. Urban Prep surrounds me with young men that actually want something out of their lives. Yeah, at Urban Prep, I stay on top of my stuff and bring my friends along with me. It's like we love each other, but we too manly to say it. These guys are serious. They're serious about their futures. They're serious about what they're doing. They understand, as our creed says, that they have a responsibility to themselves, to their community, and to their world. And our creed says we are college bound, we're exceptional. Our creed said, and we work hard at it. I try to represent being exceptional each and every day. They believe the creed, they believe those words, they understand that they're college bound. And our students have done it with our 100% college acceptance rate for our graduates. That's proof positive that our young men understand that they're going to change the world. Being here at Urban Prep is changing my life. I'm very excited about my future. Um, I'm shooting for the stars. I want to go to a good college. I want to come back with knowledge and help support my family. I want to become a mechanical engineer. Once I get my degree in engineering, I want to go into law. I will be known for my success. With everything that Urban Prep has provided us, we can accomplish greater things. We don't have to settle for the least. We can shoot for the best. This is what happens when we believe. Right. And I called them the forerunner because it was the first all-male charter school that's in the same vein that we are that was established in 2002. So it gives you kind of a sense that was the fourth case study. Okay. And on Monday, we're going, or next week, we're going to look at Chick-fil-A just, just a teeny little bit. Just a teeny bit. About culture, right? Okay, let's go to the next one, please, sir. Um, I read a book back in 2006. It was called The Influencer, and I, I, I really recommend it. But it's by Patterson, Granny, Max, Maxfield, McMillan, and Switzler. No, I was asking. I didn't know if you said you read it or you wrote it. No, I read it. I read it. I read it. Yep, I read it. And it talks about how to get people to change, how to have a positive favorable influence on other people. And one of the things you have to know your desired outcome, what to achieve and what you're measuring, obviously. We've talked about that and you'll hear that in education all the time. We talked a little bit about this earlier, which was finding vital behaviors. What are the important things that people need to actually be doing in the classrooms? Because sometimes we're doing things, but we're succeeding in spite of what we're doing and not because of what we're doing, right? I remember when Michael Johnson was the fastest person at the 400, people start running like Michael Johnson. But the reason why Michael Johnson ran that way is because he had short legs. He had, he had a long torso and short legs, and he had a leg length disparity. So he ran a certain way that was for his body. So that didn't work for everybody else, right? So we have to figure out what are the things we need to get everybody doing to be successful and why, you see? And it's not, just, it's not just one thing. 
There are multiple things that need to happen. And there are six sources of influence that they talk about in the book. The first thing is you have to have motivation and you have to have the ability. So you have to want to do it. I have to believe that this is worth doing. Even if I don't like it, and I have to believe that I can do it. Because a lot of people don't do things simply because they don't think they can. I had a young man, his name was, his, they called him Animal. That was his nickname. So you can tell, right, his name was Animal. He would just act up all the time. And so one day they came and got me. I'm the, I'm the counselor of the, you know, the administrator over the camp. They said, you know, this was, this was 12 years ago. They said, you know, Animal won't listen to anybody but you. And I said, well, I, I put the computer thing in for him. He's been asking for that. He's acting up on computers? So I go in there and they have him on a computer and they have a little exercise. And they said, you have to put in your name, your birth date, and your address. And so I said, okay. I, you know, man, you've been asking me about this computer thing for two weeks, and we set it up for you, and you're in here cutting up, so now I gotta sit with you. Come on. Name. Puts his name in. I said, okay, put your, put your birth, no, put your birth date and your address. And he puts MRS. I said, you born in March? He said, my birthday's in November. I said, okay, we'll log off. We went downstairs. He said, you know I can't read, right? I said, I know. I said, we're gonna keep that between us, you're gonna work with me. So all this time, for all this, these months, he could never read. So whenever he would get printed information in front of him, he would do something to get thrown out of group. Every day. He looked at me with tears. He said, you know I can't read, right? I said, I know. I said, but there's something all of us can't do. We're going to work on that. We're going to keep that between us for now, and we'll work on that. This is a boy who's almost 13 years old who can't read. So. His thing is, I can't do this. I, anything associated here, I'm gonna. So, motivation, personal. Help them love what they hate or to like what they don't like. Let's go into our exercise now. Ability, help them do what they can't. It sounds simple, but people don't do these things. A lot of times people just need an extra for, who's my good math people in the room? or good technological people, right? Like for some of you, you go from here to here in a step, right? People who are non-mathematical -math might have to go from here to here to here to here. Like you just can skip that step, like I got it, I see it. Somebody else needs to say, well let me go here for a minute, right? Let me go here, let me go here, okay, now I can get here. Social. Provide encouragement. So you have to set up a situation where the peers are the primary motivators of each other. You have a culture of positive peer pressure, right? It becomes a source of social capital to do these things. That's why so many kids play sports. Because, you know, it's, it's the thing to do. What if being on the golf team was the thing. One of my best school experiences was in Sterrett Classical Academy. We had a thing called the Academic Olympics. And it was the first time that I remember feeling proud to have good grades. And I remember being excited because it, it was like the thing that was celebrated at our school. Our principal's name was Dr. Davis. And it was like a big deal. So everybody wanted to become an Academic Olympian. And it was like, it's the first time I remember being in a school where that was celebrated like that, and it, it made it kind of cool. It's the best of school experience I've ever had in my life, was middle school, because of that. Provide assistance. So how do we get a culture of, of support? How do we help to dispel the culture of no snitching, right? This huge. Structural. So we change their economy, right? So we help them to understand that the things they place value in and that we reward are the right things, right? These are all things that we've heard about that are already in the vision, you see? But it, 
Because some of that may have come to you in an inspiration, but there's a scientific thing behind it. Right? Structural ability changed their space. So you have to create an environment of success. So I'm just trying to say this is what I went to when I heard this and I realized that all these boxes were being checked in my mind as I was driving around here that first day with you, right? I'm like, wow, well this is that. This, is, this aspires to be that. An environment of success. We talked about that, right, Mr. Skinner? So now let's go to the next one. So what I want us to do in our groups is I want us to go into our groups again, and we can count off or we can go back to our other groups or whatever we think is best. We're gonna to go to our respective places, and I want us to take any elements of what we've seen, and what are some things that you would be excited about replicating? If you had to create a school, we're starting with the school first, right? We wanna bring it down to the day-to-day -day interactions. But before we do it, I'm going to show you one last thing. Oh, wait. So these were our case studies. I just want to throw this up for you so you can see them, right? We had West Side with Marva Collins. And one of the things about Dr. Collins, she did not sit down the first year. Now, I'm not saying that that's, you know, the culture. But I, I found that to be just phenomenal to me because she was teaching all the students, so she didn't have a desk, and she didn't bring desks into her school, so she was always near the students. That's why I put that picture up, because that's how I saw her in my mind, and she was bent over, and she was always around the students, talking to them, she was always circulating around the room through proximity. I do a lot of proximity stuff, too, just, just by being near, somebody's doing something. So rather than uh, my cousin, Dr. Mitchell, one time, one of my, my cousins, my younger cousins, was acting up. And he was 10 at the time. And I was close enough to hear what Dr. Mitchell was saying. And so he went over to him. And he was sitting right there. And I was sitting right here. And I could hear him. He said, what, what am I supposed to do when you do what you're doing right now? He said, that's not my expectation of you, though, right? And nobody could hear it. And he just tapped his son on the shoulder. He's like, all right. And, I, and, it, and it, like, I can't think of how many times I've done that. I was younger, I was maybe 22 when I saw it, 24. And he just redirected him, he just went over near him. He was showing off, it was Dante, and he went over and put his hand on his shoulder and he said, now what, when you do what you're doing, what, am I, what do you think I'm supposed to do? And he just walked away and he, and he, he looked at him and just nodded. And then he reaffirmed him later when he was on point, he said, now see, Right. So sometimes just by being around and I'm not getting in the classroom, man, that's not my lane. Right. For this. But I'm just saying the culture of Marva Collins is that type of relationship building with students. That's why I put that up. I put Shinley because of the transformation of the historically hill based school into the premier high school in the public schools. They were taking their kids out of private schools. They were leaving to go to Shinley. Think about this. You had students from every neighborhood in the city in this building. Teachers who cried when the school closed. Because of asbestos, but it was Dr. Roosevelt who closed it. So we're looking at Shinley in terms of transformation, right? We're looking at Harlem Children's Zone in terms of scope. When you have something that's comprehensive enough to affect the whole community. You know, because you have some people I've worked in most, a lot of my schools were 99% free and reduced lunch. Now that doesn't sentence you to anything, but that's a reality for people. That's a reality for people. It affects certain decisions that you have to make, right? So he said, we have to deal with all of it. We're gonna deal with the health, we're gonna deal with the parents, you know? We're gonna create an environment for these people. And then urban prep was the male specific element, right? With the very high standards and the college preparatory environment. So, we have 15 minutes. Can I give you all, uh, I'm trying to see. So I want it to be a meaningful exercise. 
Let's do it right here at our seats, okay? I want everybody just to pick a partner and just take five minutes to discuss one idea that you were excited about and we'll share out, okay? From the case just from the case studies, okay? From the case studies. And while you do that, I want to play another video. Yep. Okay. We're in this together. I'm going to wait until they talk and then I'm going to show it. Yep. This is going to be about community. So I want us to now think in terms of this framework for just a second, right? As you make your remarks, you don't have to make reference to this, but I'm just putting that up for your reference, right? Because sometimes, you know, how do we create this peer culture? How do we create this peer support where everybody's doing certain things? And what are the vital behaviors? This is all the different stuff, right? The things we, we know, if we get enough people doing this, we're headed in the right direction. That's one thing, because if, you know, we can talk about a lot of things, but when we're doing certain things behaviorally, yeah. you know, some of us, I know some people can talk a good gym game. You know people like that? Yeah. Right? I mean, they'll actually go to the gym and make you think they're working out. Like, they're sitting there, they're socializing, they're spending like 10 minutes between exercises. They're like talking, kicking it. I told one of my boys, I said, bro, you, you've been here for an hour. You've done, you done two exercises. <laughs> he says, I know, man. I'm just trying. I said, man, listen. Let's hit the, give me, let's, for two weeks, let's do this thing. We're getting in and out of here in 30 minutes. We're going to hit this thing hard. We're going to push each other and write our goals down every single day and just see what happens. Right? Like, you go to Bally's or LA Fitness back when it was Bally's. Everybody's there on Monday, right? Boom. Monday, they're hitting it hard, right? Because we're not really, the behavior's not there. Anybody sharing out? Yeah, Group? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So we were talking about the um, West Elementary, yeah, West Elementary yeah. because like, we were close people that like to like teach on our feet and not mm -hmm. like sitting down. So like mm -hmm. we um, just thought like we're great at doing that mainly because at A, you know, you never kind of know what kind of kids we're going to get. These kids may have already fallen through the cracks wherever they are. And it makes that impossible. Not only that, like it, when you get that aha moment out of a child, it's like mm -hmm. the best feeling. You're just like, oh. and you start bragging. You're like, look at my kids. Right. So. Right. So we also established then, just based on that, is within that. Because a lot of people will talk about grit and a lot about you know work hard, but you have to have the energy to have grit and to work hard. Right. You got to have something to drive. Like. Like, I, I know for me last night, I knew that this first, I wasn't going to get a lot of sleep. And for me, I had to really get my mind right about that because I was still recovering. But I do all this other stuff and I do my exercises, I eat, you know, a certain way. So you're talking about putting that energy where you're moving around, right? We're, we're active. We create an environment of engagement. Mr. Mr. Chavis, can I get a piece of yellow paper to put up, please? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just one of those things that Thank like, you. you have to be Thank you, sir. But another thing we have said, I was talking about the Urban Park Academy, how uh, you know there's a that's 60% drop out rate from high school and switched around completely. And like I've said many times before, I think I've brought it up in my interview as well too. Growing up, like one of the kids in the video said, you can't be what you don't see. Mm -hmm. That was just one of the things that I said all. So whenever I got into the second round of interviews, and I saw, you know, a founder who was black and, you know, in that position. That was just nice to see because you don't see that often. It's like a, it's a rarity, but it needs to be more common for sure. 
but you have a lot of these kids, they don't see that as often. So luckily for these kids coming in, especially like a lot of the African Americans don't get to see that a lot more. So they'd be like, oh, I can do this, I can do that. So that's definitely one of the things that, you know, we can take and incorporate here. Yep. We also, um, and I think this goes well for everybody here in this classroom, is, or this classroom, this, this room mm -hmm. right here. It is a classroom. It is a classroom. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Is that, um, that left side of the call in there, motivation. Mm -hmm. I think everybody will see, will have these kids, these young men, that you know they may see these um, people in power, and they'll see these people with these careers that they might aspire to be, but they might not have that internal motivation or that internal drive just yet. Mm -hmm. And something that I think that I gauge from everybody in this room is, we can be those social motivators. We can change the structural viewpoints and the mindsets that these children mm -hmm. have and develop that growth mindset to become the engineer of the world, mm -hmm. be the next Bill Gates, you know, mm -hmm. to even be the next Barack Obama sometimes, I mm -hmm. like to think, you know, get there, become a senator, you know, mm -hmm. achieve for those highest expectations. Mm -hmm. and, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that from the left side, we can definitely, our, we, all, we all have that skill set. And I want to say something, oh, I'm sorry, I want to say something real quick to all of my educators of all demographics. You will be somebody in this building, I guarantee you, you will be that person for them. It's not going to be me. It's going to be you. Well, I worked at a 99% black school. And we had three or four of our white teachers were the absolute, you know, people. I mean, they, people, it was like their fathers. Because it's when you love a child and when you exemplify certain things, you never know who's going to connect with who. You just never. Some kids will connect with me because other people don't. And they feel like, well, I, I, I got a nice relationship with Mr. T. Or whatever the case may be, but every, there's something that people need to see a variety of different types, types of excellence. So always understand that there's somebody watching you and looking up to you. Right. And sometimes, you know, what I learned, Mr. Mosley, I have to be creative about that sometimes. Remember, I used to tell my daughter how beautiful she was. This is my 22-year-old. I'm like, honey, you look so beautiful. And if she went through a period where she wasn't feeling good about the way she looked, for whatever reason. And she started crying when I said it one day. She said, Daddy, you say good things to everybody. And you're my daddy. You're always going to tell me how beautiful I am. But I realized it didn't mean as much for me, so I had to find ways to say it that weren't just so, that were a little bit more specific. So she'd have on something, I said, you know, what, I don't know what you're doing with your hair right there, but that really looks nice on you. You know, what is that? And she said, well, I twisted it. And I said, man, that looks really sharp. Or I would give her real feedback on what she had on. I used to say everything looked good. <laughs> that looks good. That, not, no, that was wrong. I didn't know. Yeah. I didn't know, right? I said, you know, I like the other blue. Now that, I, I, that really looks nice, you know, it looks like you took, really took, the, you know, and I would get real specific about it and then sometimes give some constructive feedback in addition, right? You know, my son would do some, rather than tell him he did a good job, I'm like, you know, I saw you do this and this, but what I saw you do over here was you made effort where you would have normally given up on that play. You know, different ways of doing that. Mr. Skinner? Uh, for you, but, uh, oh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yep.
So it's giving that individualized attention. It's also building relationships. Ms. Collins, Mr. Collins, or whoever cares about me. There's no embarrassment here. They can be real and transparent. But then an even bigger takeoff about that was when they tried to say that the thought process was a fraud, that was, to me, an insult to her because mm -hmm. there's no way they could fake knowing about Ralph Waldo Emerson mm -hmm. and all the other writers. So mm -hmm. for me, the big thing I think that misses sometimes with, with kids that come from impoverished neighborhoods or don't have that element around them to see stuff is exposure. Mm -hmm. And that really touched me with her. She exposed them to things that they wouldn't normally be exposed to, different writers and stuff, that most people are just going through the motions because that's one of the syllabus. And see, and, and, to these icons or these greats or these masters. And when they were saying that, and then I imagine in the video, if the piece wasn't in there, about where the young people ended up. Like imagine that, that part wasn't a part of the video at all. We just saw them making nice comments when they were young and that was impressive. But when you saw how they turned out, you're like, wow. So what I think of is an alumni association for life. Where we get a situation where we connect our kids back to the school, a wall of honor for life. This is going to come up on, on next Wednesday, right? These are ideas where well, you go in and you see people who went through life. That they had that at Shinley. They had that at Westinghouse. And if you ever met the Shinley grads, man. They're proud they, to be Spartans. They're so proud. They had that yeah, they're, they're, they're proud to be Spartans. Oh, there you go. Yeah, you know, they're like they're I'm proud to be a king. And the, the yeah. So it's like when you connect where they ended up, because a lot of times we lose our kids once they go away. It's like we send them away and OK, now on to the next. Right. So what is the structure we put in place to change that? You see what I'm saying? So you're giving us that in your comments right there, because you look at those young people and you're like, wow. I mean, he's saying this is they, they wrote a whole book, The Bell Curve talking about her methods were fraudulent and the kids weren't any better. Yes, ma'am. I think you're, when you're also talking about what you're talking about, it also goes back to your branding, which I know you'll talk about with Chick-fil-A. Mm -hmm. That's brand, that's how they, when you, when you talk about your alumni and, and, and what has happened and the successes of a school, that's branding the school. And mm -hmm. so when we have to think about what brand do we want, you know, for life. Right. And so when you touch Chick-fil-A, et cetera, that'll go into the branding, but, but what's the reputation of it? What's mm -hmm. the brand? And mm -hmm. I, I think the alumni piece is, 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 is excellent. And then, uh, you know, what, what Marva Collins did, you know, she said, okay, you guys saying that, but look, here's what mm -hmm. they are. So she has data, mm -hmm. and it goes back to data, yep. having, you know, proof, you know, about, mm -hmm. um, you know, just letting the data mm -hmm. speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whether qualitative or quantitative. That's right. Um, let me, let's go ahead, jump ahead for just a second. So this is the thing I want to show um, for those who want to eat your lunch inside here. You can come in and watch the video. I just wanted to show this. But this is a, a vital behavior that they engage the students in where they bring them into an assembly every morning at Urban Prep Academy. And they start off with affirming the students in the morning. And they have drums, and it's like a pep rally they do right before school every single day. They bring them into a space. This is one of the things that Dr. Kennedy presented to me when he was talking about the school, wanting to do that. And I'm sure you mentioned it to Mr. Chavis, you know, because he talked to us, and then we, we all met together, right? And I was like, wow, you know, I was so excited to be working. Because, you know, you know, Mr. Chavis is a modest guy, but don't let that fool you. This is a gentleman with tons of experience. I mean, I, trust me, I've been around everybody. I've worked in school after school after school. You don't see a person with this type of demeanor and experience in the same person, oftentimes. You don't. I haven't. I haven't. I almost wish he wasn't in the room right now. I'm not trying to stroke him by saying that. I'm seriously. That was, that was a factor for me. Because I'm like, this is the type of person that can reach our children. You know what I mean? Makes you want to stretch. Because I saw me as wanting to have that spirit as well. 
It's up to, it's, you know, the jury is out. It's not up to me to say what I am, but people can see it. But I was excited about that. You know, I was excited about that. And so this is the type of thing where they come together and they're affirming these boys. You'll see that some of them have on red ties. Some of them have on gold ties. A gold tie means you've been accepted to a four-year college or university. A red tie means that you're still waiting for that. I'm sure these mean something. These ribbons. He has a feather in here. Right? These are just things I'm noticing in the imagery. They mean different things that you get on your jackets. Right? There, there, there was a young man in the previous video, Urban Trap, and he, Harrison, that just stood out for me. He used the phrase, something I've always believed. He said, my brothers. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's powerful. Mm -hmm. I, it, I've always, when I've greeted, known that we needed solidarity and connection. Yes, sir. I grew sir. up in an era, and I continue to this day, I don't care where I go in the world, I see a black man, I say, what's up, my brother? <laughs> and not everybody is still with that, you know? Yeah. It's, it's interesting, but that, but to hear that young man say that and identify themselves in that connection, and in a godly sense, I call us all my brothers and sisters, but particularly for being a black man, youth, if we can get our students to see that, Mm -hmm. They are brothers. They're not neighborhoods, not Homewood, Wilkinsburg, and Keysport, or whatever. They, you know, they're brothers. And, and It'll I, go far. It'll go far. Yeah, and, it's, and, and that, that type of spirit, you exude that. And you, you kind of can pick it up. We're a small staff, so this is it. This is us. <laughs> this is us, you know? So you see here that brotherly spirit, right? And in this, they say a pledge. I didn't come up with a pledge, but I, I was getting ready to go on a talk show. We were on the Chris Moore show. And what I do is I sit in my car because I don't always know what to say, you know. So I think about trying to just con connect with my spirit to say the things that need to be said. You know, it's like, let me be. I always believe that sincerity is more powerful than eloquence. So I'm like, let me just get in touch with what I need to be here. And I sat in the car, and the life creed, or the affirmation of life, came in my mind as I was sitting there. And I started saying this to myself before I got on the air. And it goes like this. We'll go to the next one. Next slide. Also, next slide. I'm going to skip that. Next. So we're going to do an envisioning exercise when we come back to create the school where you would want to send your child or your son. Okay? Using these elements. And we're just drawing from different cases from the experiences you've given on Monday, right? And from some of the stuff you definitely don't want to see as well. Okay, so next slide. So I was sitting in the car and I just started saying this to myself, literally. I pulled over it right at the Staples and I just closed my eyes and I'm, I, you know, I used to write and stuff so I said, it goes, we talk life, we walk life. We seek life, we speak life, we respect life, and we serve life to protect life and preserve life. We love life, we live life, so we shine bright and we give life. Living intelligently, fulfilling expectations. Who are we? We are life. We are life. <laughs> Who are we scholars? We are life. Who are we leaders? We are life. Want to say it one time with me? Yeah. Everybody stand up. Yeah. Come on. Hey. I, was there, I was there when he created this. Oh, <laughs> so, so this part, I say this and you say this, yeah. or if on this particular day, if, if Doc is saying this, then she would be leading or whoever's leading, right? Or Mr. C's leading it, right? But on this part, you repeat after me, or the leader, whoever that is, but on this part, you don't repeat this, you just come back with this, right? So we come back, we are life. Y'all ready? ready? All right. We talk life. We, talk we, walk life. Life. we walk life. We walk life. We seek life. We seek life. We speak life. We speak life. We respect life. We respect life. 
and we serve life to protect life and preserve life. We love life. We live life. So we shine bright and we give life. Living intelligently, fulfilling expectations. Who are we? Who are we scholars? We are life. Who are we leaders? We are life. You got that? <laughs> OK. So this is just a, a thought. You know, we have to have it approved, and we get it and see it. But, but, I, was, I, but I was saying that to myself in the car, and it just came into me. I started saying it as I was sitting there. We are, 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 we are. So that is the end of this portion. I think we have lunch. Uh, we will come back and we're going to build everything I'm doing kind of builds on each other. But I'm trying to put in elements so that we know that we you are the founders. These are the founders, but you are the first generation life. Right. So we get a chance to do something that none of us have done before, which is to give the school the spirit that it's going to have, right? It's a very special thing to do. I'm honored to work with you all. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you.